Hey everybody, welcome back to week five of our identity campaign and series. I trust that God's been doing a deep, deep work in your heart and that you've discovered a whole lot more of who He has made you and how He made you in connection with who He is in you and, and, and by extension who you are because of your relationship with Him. Can I call you child of God? Can I call you um, servant of God, can I call you saint of God? Quick recap about the themes we've already covered so far. And remember to complete your fill in words in your workbook on page 13 this week. Firstly, we spoke about this idea, this wonderful truth that I am his child, worthy. He is my father. What an amazing truth. Fill that in in your workbook. I am a child. Secondly, I am his servant. He is my master. The fill in word here, a servant. How did that settle on you? Thirdly, last week we spoke about the fact that I am a saint. He is my savior. I'm a saint. Fill it in there on page 13. And we unpacked what it meant to be made holy by Christ when we come to him in faith. Then how he's making us more like him. (laughs) How we deal with the sinful mistakes, transformed and transforming. Have you settled these things in your heart and spirit? And are you starting to live from that point of victory and truth in your life? Child, servant, saint. Our theme today is this. I am a citizen of heaven. He is my king. Your fill in word here, guess? Citizen. That's wonderful. Put it in there. Paul puts it like this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. You are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. You've been included and given a new citizenship and a new nationality, if you like. The kingdom of heaven. And so in Philippians chapter 3, he says to um, the church in the town of Philippi, But our citizenship is in heaven. Fill your words in there. Citizens and heaven in that paragraph. Our citizenship is in heaven. Wow. (laughs) What does it mean? Well, maybe let's look at a story. I'm a South African uh, passport holder. Um, Proudly. Inconvenient, but proudly. I was born in this beautiful country and I've lived here all of my life. And, And if I heard correctly, I will stay here. I'm not one of those that God wants to necessarily send to another country. But whenever we travel into other countries, and and I have to confess, (laughs) I have wished that I had another country's passport to travel with. Um, uh, Mel and I have had the the privilege of traveling now in the latter parts of our lives to some European destinations. And, And quite recently into India, quite extensively, we've stopped over in some African countries. Middle Eastern airports, and unfortunately our South African beautiful green passport does nothing. (laughs) Compare this to a British passport, we just walk into a special queue Um, in Europe and in Africa and and there you go, welcome. Uh, European Union passports, uh, welcome home. (laughs) Just about everywhere you go, flying through immigration, shorter queues. Special queues, no extra cost for visas or permits, no restrictions in terms of time allowed in a country. It just seems like a dream, doesn't it? To have maybe another country, a stronger passport, strong week. But then we arrive at Oatambo, oh, international airport, and in our beautiful country, in our beautiful city, Joburg, uh, the city of Johannesburg, the city of gold, creative, diverse, peaceful. And you know what? We know we are citizens because we are welcomed home. Immigration for us arriving back is a breeze. South Africa and passport holders, hey, this way. The rest, even if there are 12 cubicles and only three operators open, you know, we are home. We are where we belong. It just feels welcoming because we are citizens. Where we are going and which country passport or country's passport we travel with and who who we belong to, whose citizens we are, is a very important factor in our lives. Hebrews 11 is this incredible chapter of faith 
warriors in the New Testament. And the writer of Hebrews gives us all these examples of, the, of, of people that lived by faith. Giants. And the guy that we're going to look at in this session uh, today is Moses. We're going to read Hebrews 11 from verse 24 through to 27. And it starts off like this. By faith, Moses chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than, you're filling words, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than, fill in words, greater than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward by faith. He left Egypt not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Isn't it gorgeous? To fill in phrases here to complete it, rather than and greater value than. Now this is a brief summary of the life of Moses. Um, and we read Moses' story and uh, all the way back in, in the book of Exodus. But basically, the writer of Hebrews is saying because Moses knew that his citizenship was in heaven, some parts of his life changed radically compared to his earthly citizenship, which at that time was the son of royalty in the country of Egypt. I'd like you to notice these two fill-in phrases, rather than and of greater value than. Our citizenship and, and whatever country you carry a passport and an identity document for, that, according to the scripture, is the smaller than, the less than. That's the minor detail of our lives. The greater than is our citizen, and this citizenship is in heaven. And because of that, we live with a rather than mindset. I would rather live like this than like that, because I am a citizen of heaven. Uh, well, to put it uh, like this, um, as a citizen of heaven, firstly, my love for Christ should displace the fleeting pleasures of sin. Fill in this small word, sin. Three letters, but what a massive impact it has on our lives. Now we've got these sinful desires and ways that we were born into and that we live out. And what's interesting is that it says about Moses that he chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, of Egypt. Again, a filling word, sin. Going back to the book of Philippians. Uh, which Paul writes to the church in Philippi about the mindset of people who haven't yet become citizens of heaven. And he describes it as follows, verse 18. For all, as I have often told you before, and, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Your fill in words here being earthly things and heaven. Think about it. If you've got a pen, underline these words, please. Destiny. Their destiny is destruction. And line the following words. Their God is their stomach. In other words, the earthly desires, how they feel, what they eat and drink and how they live, and they, is, is their God. Their glory is their God. Another word to underline in this passage is the word shame. That is their reward. Shame. <laughs> quite straight and quite harsh. But that's basically how people live outside of Christ. This distinguishing feature of an earthly citizenship that our minds are set on earthly things and that, that is, is, is starkly contrasted uh, with this, that our citizenship is in heaven. And we are to eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes here about the mindset of people who haven't yet become citizens of heaven. 
and he describes it like this. So, so we're comparing the rather than and the greater than in these passages. In, in, in other words, the earthly desire, how they feel, what they eat, what they drink, how they live and their glory uh, is, is shame. The mindset on earthly things and, and this will lead to shame. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps to save us from our citizenship of earth in a greater way and in a greater measure. Our glory, of course, is not our shame. Our glory is hope in Christ and Christ Himself. Now, if we were just earthly citizens, if we had never met Christ, we, we could be excused for living with our destiny being destruction. Just the end. Our stomachs being our God's consumption minded glory and our shame and our mindsets on earthly things. But Paul is trying to encourage us. He's trying to encourage the people of this church. He's saying, guys, because you are citizens of heaven, you get to live a different kind of life, a greater than, a rather than life. And your love for that King, King Jesus, should displace your love for the fleeting pleasures of sin. How many of you know um, that our desires transform when we let go of a lesser pleasure for a greater pleasure? Because Christ is our King and because we are citizens of heaven, this should change our view on almost everything here on earth. It should change our view on finances. Because we are citizens of heaven, we should live with a wildly generous outlook and wildly generous life. Because of our love for Jesus Christ, our King, and our citizenship is in heaven, it should change our view on sexuality. We say physical sexual intimacy, the marriage for the marriage bed, for our covenant partner, because of how King Jesus has created this beautiful covenant of marriage. In hardships, oh, and don't we often have that. We, we should take the long view, which means sometimes sticking with things that are really difficult, persevering in things through the hard task, perhaps sticking it out in a demanding, uncomfortable job, or when things aren't going quite our way, because our citizenship is in heaven. You know, we keep on keeping on, because our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, our love for Christ displaces the fleeting pleasures of sin as a citizen of heaven. Secondly, in your workbook still on page 13, my love for Christ should overtake my desire for worldly possessions and achievements. Fill in the word to complete this statement is possessions. There I touch this topic. Because of my love for Him, the natural born desire for worldly possessions and achievements get overtaken or should be overtaken by my love for Christ. Let's go back to the story of Moses. We just uh, read in verse 26 that he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Because, because he was looking ahead to his reward. F fill in the, the word treasures and the treasures of Egypt paled in comparison. Because we look ahead to our future award and reward as citizens of heaven, we can in some way look in disdain on the best that this world has to offer because Christ is so much more and far greater a reward. Rick Warren um, puts it like this. He says, you will not be in heaven for two seconds before you cry out. Why did I place so much importance on things that were so temporary? What was I thinking? Why did I waste so much time, energy and concern on what wasn't going to last? I'm challenged by this and I put this challenge to you as well. Are our minds so taken with earthly things and worldly possessions and achievements that we've missed out on the fact that we are citizens of heaven? And by the way, there's, there's nothing in the Bible that says these things uh, are wrong and sinful in themselves. Where the problem comes in is when our hearts, your and my heart, become overly attached and concerned 
to those things and with those things. We could put it like this, thirdly, that as a citizen of heaven, my love for Jesus Christ should satisfy my craving for human approval. Verse 27, um, complete your statement with the, the filling word there, approval. Yo. We're talking today about how do I prepare my life for eternity. We're speaking about the fact that the fleeting pleasures of sin are displaced by our love for Jesus. That worldly possessions and the achievements of life, our desire for that, is overtaken by the love we have for Jesus. And now thirdly, I come and I say our craving for human approval is superseded, should be satisfied by our love for Jesus. These are challenging things. Listen to what it says about Moses. It says, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Hebrews 11, 27. Fill in words here, not fearing the king's anger. The verse is profound. Tucked away. Inside every single one of us is this hole that seeks for approval from others. We look for it from a very early age from our parents, from our siblings, uh, siblings. As we grow, we look for it from authority figures and from peers, and then we start to look for it in romantic relationships, other interactions throughout our lives. It's like we're born with this craving for human approval. But here's the difficulty with that craving. We will go to great lengths to get it, and sometimes those great lengths will be very unhealthy. And no matter how much human approval you and I get, it still leaves this gap in our human souls. What that gap tells us is that we were designed for even greater approval. And when I realize that Jesus Christ approves of me and He loves me and He cares for me, it changes everything. It moves me from living out of the fear of living for other people's approval and it moves me into living with perseverance. Do you see that in this verse? It says he did not fear the king's anger. He didn't live with his whole life based around human approval but persevered because he saw him who is invisible. I love that verse. Paul puts it like this in Galatians 1 and he says, am I now trying to win the approval of filling word of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Fill in your word there. Approval of, of humans. Like for some people watching this, I feel this might be a critical step in moving forward in your relationship with God. Perhaps till now you might have lived uh, bound by desperately trying to get um, other people's approval and it just doesn't seem to come. It's just never enough. What a liberating thing to find out that we are citizens of heaven and we already have the approval of Christ our King on us. He picked us. He loves us. Another way to put it is like this. As a citizen of heaven, my status is secure. I'm already loved accepted and my king is well pleased loved accepted and my king is well pleased fill those words in but fill them in your heart you are loved you are accepted and your king is well pleased with you and resound and sing and shout it out and scream it out yes lord i am this is some of the best news that any of us could ever hear it is in spite of us and in all the trivial things that we try to do to broker security we are a citizen of heaven and we are loved, approved, accepted. He is already well pleased with me. And from that base, I now start living for him. But not just for him, I also live together with him. Because you see, this amazing king of ours is not just distant at the end of the finish line waiting for us to get there. No. <laughs> He is there with us, walking with us every single step of the way. When we put our faith in Him, He gives us the Holy Spirit on the inside of us to empower us and to remind us that this world is not our home. The very best that this world offers 
is temporary. What heaven has to offer is absolutely eternal. The very best in this life cannot even begin to match the very lowest aspect of heaven. This is great news. This world in its present form, the Bible tells us, is passing away. But this kingdom will endure forever. Thankfully, our citizenship is in that kingdom that will endure forever. When we get there, one day, we'll be welcomed. And we'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome to heaven. I hope that that gives you great perseverance, as it does for Moses, or did for Moses, and as it does for me. Um, this week, may this resound and stir up in you. And yeah, all I can say is, God bless. See you on the other side. Thank you.